Jesus. Chapter thirty, and thir we're going to, uh, or chapter six, verses uh, thirty to thirty-two. I was just jumping back a couple uh, verses before we jumped into chapter ten. Hopefully, I got that right for you up on the board. <laughs> Is that Romans nine, not six, up there? Well, it's Romans six. six. It's Romans six. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh my goodness. Okay, well, let's go to straight to our text then. We're going to go to Romans 9, verse 1. I mean 10, verse 1, sorry. Just messing with you. Romans 10, verse 1. So, as we went through chapter 9, you know, it was... The, the two uh, friends that are trying to be reconciled, right? Uh, the sovereignty of God and, and the, the, the uh, what is it? The sovereignty of God and the um, free will of man or the responsibility of man. And chapter 9, the way it work, works out is chapter 9 is really focused on God's sovereignty. And so last week as we were going through chapter 9, I thought it was really interesting how Paul went back through, because he's ministering to really the Jews that have been saved, but they're still really struggling because their whole religion was based upon the law. And these Jews that are in Rome, he's sharing with them, trying to clear some, clear some things up. And not just for them, but because, you know, if they don't know what the truth is and they're sharing the truth that they think is the truth, but it's not. And, you know, the Gentiles that are getting saved, they're getting confused. And, and so Paul is there and he's like, you know, we need to make this clear. And so what's the one thing that he, that he really cares about is Jesus Christ and him crucified, right? I mean, we can disagree about all kinds of other stuff. But when it comes down to Jesus Christ and his cruci and his uh, the cross and crucifixion and our salvation by grace through faith, you can't mess around with that, right? And um, that's when it comes to, it's life and death, really. It's life and death. And we, we might not think of it like that, but really it is. It's life and death, but it's worse than just life and death physically because we're talking about eternal. It's eternal life and death. And so, you know, it was difficult for the Jews because... You know, basically became like the Judaizers, right? They're, and they were, you know, once you add, start adding rules and laws, it never goes the other way, right? You ever notice that? Like the SOP book, it just keeps getting thicker, you know? It's like, it, you never go, hey, let's, we're going to meet guys and take out some rules, you know? It doesn't go that way. And then you have to have more rules to explain the rules, and then, you know, it just keeps getting more confusing. And so, you know, the Jews, it was really... A lot of work to maintain that and um, those guys are tough man because I would have gave up a long time ago <laughs> but praise God you know that I mean that's kind of what happened when we got saved right is <clears throat> we were trying to do it our own way you know I wasn't a Jew but still I was empty just like a Jew was because they were filling themselves with something that wasn't Christ right and that's what you were doing too whatever it was you know whether it was drugs or sex or which could be anything, right? It could be food, it could be whatever. But you just fill yourself, fill yourself, and you keep finding yourself temporarily satisfied and you're empty. And so Paul, you know, being a Jew, right? He loves the Jews, but he's been called to the Gentiles. And so this is really his chance to minister to his own, you know, and, and so he pours out his heart in these next couple chapters, uh, which is so important, you know, and I don't know, there's always this big movement of, you know, does the church replace Israel, which I think is crazy, um, you know, the replacement theology and all of that. Um, but I, I think, you know, sometimes we get into theology and then we're, it's like we're, when we read our Bibles, um, 
you're like, oh, what is that? What do I, what do I think that is? Or we get kind of nervous. Oh, I don't want to. Am I not? I'm not thinking like replacement theology. I'm like, no, you're not, because the Bible walks you through it. And, and Paul is saying, yes, this, all these guys aren't Israel. Some of them are. There's a remnant, right? And so it's interesting. I find myself when I say anything about Israel, it's not like perfect. But I'm, oh, I'm not doing the rem- I'm not like turning my theology. Am I? You know. But it, it's you're not. You're safe in the Word of God. You know, and so what's so amazing is we can go verse by verse, and you don't have to worry about it. It's interesting because I'll share a piece of the message that I'm going to share with my wife, and she's in the middle, and I'll share something with her. And then it's funny because she goes, replacement theology, you know, and I'm like, no, you know, but it's because she didn't hear the whole context, right? And that's what's so crazy about the, the, the Bible is... Um, there's no way that you can read one verse here and one verse there and, and get truth out of it because, I mean, even as a believer in your own walk with God, that's not the healthy way to, to grow because, um, you know, we naturally just like to transform things into what is easy for us to receive and, um, you know, whether we know we do it or not, you know, but when we read through the scriptures, you get the big picture. And it's just been a blessing reading through the, the big pictures. We know how much God loves Israel, and God chose Israel. And, you know, Paul, the whole, Paul's whole point is that uh, God is sovereign, right? God is God, and he's God, and you're not. And uh, as he goes through, and, he's, and he, he ties into the, he knows how to do it, speaking to the Jews, because he, he is, well, he was, well, he's a Jew, right? He got saved, and so... He's pulling into like Moses and Abraham, and, and he knows that because these guys were around before the law, right? And Moses brought the law, and so uh, he brings the example up of Moses and Pharaoh and how um, you know God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And when you read it, I don't know, I struggle with that because you're like, it's not fair. God hardened his heart, and then he has to go through all these plagues, and, and you're like, but God keeps hardening his heart, but. He hardened his heart first, though, if you read it. Um, and then he's like to the point where he's like, just one more day with the frogs, you know? And you're like, are you insane? Like, but it's because God actually hardened his heart to where he he wasn't even able, like even if he wanted to, it's like you almost see him kind of like, oh, I just need to, like he's tired himself, right? Not going God's way, and he wants to give up, but it was God said, you know what? I'm going to use you as a vessel of dishonor to glorify me. And God can do that, you know. We think that that's not fair, but when you think about it, it doesn't go both ways. God pours out his justice evenly, no matter who you are. But you know what? God can put mercy on whoever he wants. And it's not, it, we don't want anything to do with God's justice, I promise. Because if God was just, that wouldn't be, if he was just, gave us just his justice, we wouldn't want that. You know, but what's amazing is that whenever we see God give mercy, that's when everybody goes, well, that's not fair, you know. <laughs> but we have to back up and look at the big picture. God knows the beginning and the end. He knew you before you were in your mother's womb, right? So if he knew you before you were in your mother's womb, he knew your, your beginning, he knows your end. And so he's able to say, I chose you. Why did he choose you? Because he knows you, right? But we live in time, and, but he's not. He's not in time. And so it's his foreknowledge, right? The Bible talks about his foreknowledge. And so uh, Paul is going through and he's making sure that they understand that God is sovereign. Because to them, they're thinking, Gentiles, uh, there's no way that God's for the Gentiles, you know? And uh, what's amazing, we'll see this morning that Paul pulls up scriptures that are from the Old Testament. They're talking about him loving the Gentiles, reaching out to the Gentiles. But so when it moves into chapter 9, it switches from the sovereignty of God to the responsibility of man. Like, we have a responsibility. And it's clear when you get into chapter 9. Like, I don't know how you can be a Calvinist and read chapter 9, because it's absolutely amazing. Um, There's no way that you don't have a choice, because... Chapter 9 is all about your choice. And so, uh, let's see. I wanted to read Genesis 
chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It says, so now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And he says, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. You will be a blessing. So Israel's supposed to be this extension from Christ. God chose them because he is God and he wanted to. Not because they were something special, but they're special because he chose them. And they didn't do it. What were they supposed to do? They were, the blessed is supposed to be a blessing. That's what it says. They're to be blessed. They've got all of these things of the Lord, you know, that nobody, nobody else, no other people was chosen like that. And but the idea was that they were supposed to bless the nations, but they didn't do that. Uh, verse three says, "I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you." And in all the families of the earth, uh, and then in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so it's amazing because just in this, you see that God had a plan, has a plan. And even though he knows Israel wasn't going to go with this plan, but he used that in his plan because he knew that he, Jesus, he was going to send his son to die on the cross. So this is like mind boggling for us because we're like going, this is crazy. Like, because we're just using a little piece of our brain, you know, and, he, and he's infinite and we're, you know, we're, we're, he's finite, right? No, we're infinite. He's finite. And um, I said that back. You guys know what I'm saying. <laughs> but um, he's God and we're not. And so God used Israel for his purpose in extending his, his grace to the world. But you know, it had nothing to do with striving for the law. And that's where the Jews did. That's where they lost it. Because they, they thought they were serving God. They thought they were like Paul was. Paul was like, I'm, I'm serving the Lord, like he was a zealot. And so the Bible tells us that the law was given as a tutor to lead the nation of Israel to Christ. That's what the law was for, it was a tutor, it had a purpose. So they saw the law for one thing, but God knew what the law was for. It wasn't for them to follow, to be perfect, that they could have a relationship with God. Really what it was, uh, Galatians 22 through 24, Paul talks about it here. Galatians 3, 22, he says, The scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. That sounds like a good plan, <laughs> right? That because the scripture it confines us all under sin. But because of that, the promise by faith in Jesus Christ that's how we're all receiving faith in Jesus Christ. By what? By believing. I will bless those. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. Kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law kept us till the Messiah was going to come. And it kept the Jews until the Messiah would come, but you could also say, you know, it kept anybody until the Messiah would come because if it wasn't for the law, if it wasn't for the sacrificial system, God would have poured out his wrath upon the earth already, right? Because it was that that held back his wrath for a time until the Messiah would come. But it's just so amazing to see how God like in the last chapter, how he even talked about Jacob and Esau. And you're like, wait, the twins, they didn't do anything yet? Well, how could God choose one over the other? Because he's God, right? But the thing is, is that you don't understand that he knows the beginning and the end. So it, this is what I always have to ask myself. Is my God just? Is my God just? Yes, he's just. So when my daughter... Gabriella died 17 days old. Then I say, what in the world is going on? I don't understand. That's not fair, you know? But I just go back to this. Is God just, right? This place is temporary. And God loves her more than I love her. 
you know, and that's his kid, you know, and it's like, but all these little things in our life that we get hung up on, whether we're like the Jews trying to hang on to the law, trying to earn our way, or just the rough things that happen for us in life, you know, as Gentiles, you know, we're not really thinking maybe like the law like they are, but still we question like, God, what are you doing? God, I don't understand what you're doing right here. But God has a plan and he's faithful. And so when we come to God, we come by grace through faith. But we naturally, even though we're Gentiles, we even try to go back to this thing that works. And everywhere we go, the world is, is feeding us this too. Because it's just the world we live in, right? You think it would be an opposite because you're like, nobody wants to work today. <laughs> but still, it's not the same. No. I mean, people, it is still for our salvation. We can never receive it without working for it, earning it. Because it's our pride, right? It's our pride. But, you know, it sounds right like if good advice, right? You get good advice. You go to churches. They don't teach the Bible, and they give you great advice. Mm -hmm. And you go, I'm going to apply that to my life. You know, so you go and you strive to apply that to your life because you're a godly person. Mm -hmm. And what happens is you're striving in your flesh. But that's only striving you just to work harder in the flesh. You know, this letter, uh, if you check this letter right here, that this was given to a young man. He turned to Christ and he receives this letter. I want you to, as we read it together, I want you to think to yourself if this is good advice for a new believer, okay? So just think about it as we read it together. The basic question about religion, this person just got saved, is how to elevate man and to bring him into a closer relationship with God. We believe that God revealed to us in the Torah, the Law of Moses, how he wants us to live so that we can be in harmony with his divine purpose. Our role and religious purpose is to obey God's laws, to love him and obey him. We exercise our free will by proper intention, through having done good deeds, we're elevated so that it becomes progressively easier and easier for it to be natural for you to do good and to resist evil. That's true, right? But is this good advice for a new believer? Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? No. <laughs> There's some things in there that you go, okay, that's cool. But you know what? That is somebody right there that has no idea what it is to be saved by grace through faith. Because that's not what our relationship is based upon. If you do think that's good, I hope you don't listen to Joel Osteen. <laughs> <laughs> because you might think everything that guy's preaching is, is good. And I'm telling you, it, it, it's not. Paul, he's not trying to condemn his people in this section of scripture. Right? He loves them. But he wants them to have what he's been given. I mean, his life has been rocked. You know? He was on the way to go get the decree to kill these guys. And God knocks him on his butt. I mean, imagine how fast things went in Paul's life. From the moment he got saved, it was like, boom! Everything was new, right? And you're thinking, that's what it was for me too. You know, well, at least that's what it was for me. But the righteousness... It was imputed to him in that very moment. The requirement of the law was fulfilled, right? He was considered just. And so Paul is warning them to have, he wants them to have what he has, you know, what he found. He doesn't want them to stay getting caught up in the law, and he doesn't want even the Gentiles to go back to the law. No condemnation, right? That's what Paul said in chapter 8. He started with no condemnation. And then he ended chapter 8 with no separation. Right? No condemnation, no separation. And that is what Paul wants them to have in their life, just like we do all the people we know that we know don't know Jesus. We're like, man, I just want you to know what that is. To have no condemnation and then to have no separation. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. 
That was a rabbi that wrote the letter here, and he was writing it to another Jew. So the Jew's position, or the rabbi's position, right, is on how to get right before God. Simply keep working until it becomes easier and easier, right? And then you're elevated to a place where finally, you know, you, you have this righteousness that you've obtained a little bit before him. And it's interesting because uh, if you guys are Catholic, I'm not against Catholics, but I wanted to share the truth about Catholics this morning because it's part of my text. I went to a school, and where I was at the school, I was going for nursing, but they had a class, and it was on, on uh, it was ethics, but it really wasn't, it was Catholicism. So I had to take this class, and I'm praying, Lord, I've always wanted to know, what is the missing, it's like, it's kind of like evolution, what's the missing link, you know? Like, what is the missing link with the, the Catholics? Like, what is the deal here? Because we're, we're Christians, they're not. Did you know that? Don't get that confused. They're not Christians, and you are. And I didn't really even understand all that. But until I, I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to sit in this class. Every day I'm taking notes, and I just pray that through the Holy Spirit, you minister to me your word. And I would write notes. And at the end, I would sit down and go talk to the nun that was teaching, right? And it was amazing because she was a born-again nun, I guarantee it, I know it. But her whole life was consisting of trying to conform Catholicism to fit what she knew was true in her heart. Mm -hmm. And it was crazy getting harder and harder every time a new pope come in, came out. Because yeah. as the pope got worse, it was making her life harder. Because she'd have to try to come up with new things to justify why the pope can be right and be the thing to listen to, but yet it's not quite according to the word of God, you know? Mm -hmm. But she, this woman was amazing. She wrote to the Vatican, oh. and she wrote for the Vatican. And I'm in her class, and one day we had to write an essay. And everyone got up and got their papers, and I was just kind of going, whatever, I don't care what I did. And I got what was left. What was left was the hard one. It was what she wrote on faith. It was an article that she wrote on faith, and I was like, whoa, this is like Greek, man. <laughs> but I, I kept reading it over and over again, man, and until I understood what they were saying what she was saying, what she believes. Because try to explain faith even in what you believe. It's difficult, right? Mm -hmm. But when she, I understood finally what she was saying, and I realized, there it is. It was cool. God gave me the answer. It's all about faith. Because just like this rabbi here, this letter sounds good. You're like, love God, obey God. Yeah. You know, it, all, it gets easier to serve him, you know? And you, you know you build these habits in your life. Well, check this out. Nobody showed this to me, but the Holy Spirit did. God did. Because I'm in this class, and they make nuns at this school, and I'm like, okay. I go across the hall because they're, they're a nun class, and I go, how do you know when you're nunified? Like, like when you graduate, and now you're a nun. You know what I mean? How's it, who, who says you're the nun? You know, you're a nun now. And it was amazing because the young lady goes, when you receive your habit. And I was like, you receive your habit? What's a habit? That's that black and white thing they wear. It's called a habit. Check this out. In that moment, the Holy Spirit showed me. They put on a habit and we put on Christ. Amen. Is that amazing? Because we put on Christ. But and as I read her letter, you know what it was? It said this. It was faith. The bumper is like on a, on a uh, when you bowl, mm -hmm. the bumper is so you can't roll it, throw a gutter ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the kid, they put that up for the kids. Well, for you, you decide what's the truth in your life. Mm -hmm. Nothing that's on uh, CNN, no. <laughs> you, you decide what's true and what's not true. And you solidify it by, they, they would take things and solidify it. Like if it was from scripture, solidify it. If it's from the Pope, it would solidify it. Right, something that you think is true, it goes into that category. Mm -hmm. And then that's true, and that's true, and that's true. And what's happening is you're building your gutter protector, right? Where you can't throw a gutter ball. Mm -hmm. And it's like your life, you know? Because what happens when you start doing this, then what happens is that thing that you're doing over time, it becomes a virtue, they say. It becomes a virtue, right? Because, and you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, and then it becomes a habit. Well, when it becomes a habit, that's entering into the rest of the Lord. Because you're not working so hard anymore to not sin. Because now it's become a habit. I'm like, is that the rest that the Lord is talking about when you enter into the rest of the Lord? Mm -hmm. That's not. 
The rest is the fact that he died on the cross for your sin and he's washed away all of your sin. And he's not only done that, but he's taken care of all the requirements that you have to fulfill in order to be righteous before him. And he imputed it to you and said, no, you're righteous. It's my righteousness that's been imputed to you now. I see you as perfect and justified. Even though you're in that process of sanctification, everyone else looks at you and they go, you're under construction. God does it because he sees the beginning and the end. And that's why he says you're seated in the heavenlies, right? Because we're finished. It's finished, he said, on the cross, right? And so I was blown away that they put on a habit. Mm -hmm. And I was reading about uh, Charles Spurgeon, I think, because I was trying to get some ammo for my paper. <laughs> and it was amazing because he brought up this text. And I just want to share it with you with the scripture because I think it's monumental. It has been in my life. You remember the, uh, the serp, brass serpent, right? Mm -hmm. And if they, they got stunned by the bee, or the, the bee, by a snake, bit by a snake, and they would die. They were going to die. And then what was the answer? If you could just look upon the brass serpent, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, all this is uh, symbolism like brass is judgment, and, uh, you know, it's looking upon Jesus, right? God. And, but it's interesting because how many guy people were bitten by the snake and they're told over and over, dude, just all you got to do is look at the brass serpent, right? But people are like, well, I'm rubbing dirt on it. I know you only got like 30 seconds before that gets into your bloodstream, you know, and they're sucking it out or you know, whatever they're doing. Well, I heard if you rub this root on it, you know, like they're trying to do the last minute thing to stay alive. And then all they have to do is look at the brass serpent. Right? And then, boom, they're cured like that, healed, gone. And it's amazing because how many of them died because they didn't, didn't just look at the brass serpent. And it's amazing because the scripture that talks about the brass serpent, I, don't, I wish I had looked it up, but I know I was going to share this with you. But you can study your own Bible and find it. <clears throat> Where it's the same exact verse that's used in the New Testament, but there's a switch in words. The word is believe. In the Old Testament, he says, look, look upon the brass serpent. New Testament, it's not look, it's believe upon, right? And you'll be saved. It's the same verse, but it's just that those two words switched. So in the Old Testament, they looked with their eyes. In the New Testament, how do we believe, how do we receive Christ? We look with our faith, right? We believe. So we look with our faith upon Jesus, right? Isn't that amazing? And I was like, bam, that's what faith is, suck up. No. <laughs> no, I was just like, no, but it's like, that is faith. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not about what you do. It's about what he did. The faith part, if you want to work hard at being close to God, like he was telling this young man, do this and do that. Build habits in your life. No, fix your eyes on Jesus. That's it. Believe on Jesus. That's your work is to believe. If it's any more than that, then you're not, you're not under grace, man. And if you're not under grace, we're going to see right here Moses says you've got to abide by all of it. If you can't abide by all of it, then it's not going to work. And so that changed my life. That time in that Class. I was so thankful that I took that class. I thought I was going to go be a nurse. And all that. I didn't even, I dropped out of school and didn't even do that. It was all about just that class. <laughs> but I still pray for that woman that she will wake up one day and just take that thing off, man, and have, realize the freedom she has in Christ because she's precious. Uh, her name's Angelica, so you guys can all pray for her. <laughs> um, but look at Paul's heart for his brethren when he says, in verse 1, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Like, you can just hear him, like, his voice cracking here, you know? For I bear them witness that they have zeal for God. You know, he's probably thinking, man, there's these other people that have the real deal, and they're like turds. They're blobs, right? He's like, you know, because he was zealous, right? What, Paul's the kind of guy, like, if he does it, he does it 100%, you know? And... So you know that, that he's like going, it's hard because they're so zealous, but it's zealous for the wrong thing. And he is like, that's where I was. 
It's not according to knowledge, right? It's not according to truth. So it's easy for a zealous person to think that, or to be lost because they think that, you know, religion is like this ladder that you elevate. It's a self-help, listen to Joel Osteen, live your best life now type thing, right? Like, how do I do that? Apply this and then these rules, right? But a true believer, we should be filled with zeal. And then maybe if we're not, we're kind of going, well, am I not really saved or what? <laughs> no. I mean, it's like, what's going on? I should have the joy of the Lord in my life, but I can tell you, I've lived a lot of years where I felt like I didn't have it. And it was by faith, you know? Because it's not by feeling, it's by truth. It's by truth. But a man or woman can be zealous for the scriptures, you can be zealous for Sunday school, people are in ministry, there's pastors that are not going to be raptured, man, <laughs> you know? Paul wanted the Romans to see that zealous people can be lost. And he says, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. God's saying, just submit. It's right here. Just look upon the serpent. No, i got to do it. You know, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who works really hard. <laughs> for everyone that believes. He forgot to mention baptism, didn't he? I always think that. Why is it Paul, in the scriptures, he said, I'm th I thank God I didn't baptize any of you. And then when you keep reading, he goes, oh yeah, I didn't baptize a couple of you, I forgot. But it's interesting, do you think he would ever say that? If baptism was required for salvation? Like, there's no way. That's insanity. The Jews were given a path, instead of turning to God in repentance, they sought to establish their own righteousness. They, they saw the law as a way to lift themselves up to God, right? That's that whole live your best life now thing. You're applying good advice to your life. It's crazy how there's a small difference, I'm telling you. It's like this, like you don't even know it. But if you want to strive for something, the book of Hebrews says, strive to enter into my rest. Mm -hmm. He says that they kept going around in a circle because why? He says they didn't believe. That's why. Mm -hmm. It was because they didn't believe. And he said, dude, today is the day of salvation. Enter my, to my rest. There's still a rest to be entered into because they didn't enter into it. Because Moses could only take them so far. And who had to take them the rest of the way in? Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, right? So Paul brings this false thinking into this perfect focus. And so he's saying, Christ is the end of the law. There's righteousness, but it's for everybody that believes. And Christ perfectly fulfilled this himself through his perfect obedience, which none of us could ever do. And he offers this new righteousness to those that will receive it. So you can't tell me this doesn't take receiving, because it does, obviously. Because if you work for it, you're not receiving it, right? Mm -hmm. The responsibility is on the one that's receiving, because your work is to believe. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. You want to go by the law? Okay, good then make sure you do them all. I don't want to have to live to that standard because you'll never make it. Philippians 3, 8, 9 says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. This is amazing because this Paul's got it. Like this is what it's all about, is about Jesus. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith, faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God, God, God's sovereignty, his plan made this, go with his plan. It was sending his son to the cross to die for your sin, and Jesus did it. He said, not my will be done, but yours, and he went to the cross. And we have to believe. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way, Paul says, don't say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? 
we don't really talk like that, but we act like that sometimes. I know you know, you know what I'm saying, because you're like, God, where are you? You know, That's kind of what it is. It's like, you know, it's to bring Christ down from above. It's like you're, you're looking for another hope, you know? It, or who will descend into the abyss, right? Because it's about the resurrection. Because we died with Christ, but we also resurrect with Christ. And it was, if he didn't die, then we have nothing. But who will descend into the abyss? Who will? He already did. So Paul, he's getting his text from Deuteronomy chapter 30, which is actually Paul uh, Moses' farewell address. But we don't have to go to heaven or to the underworld to find Jesus. It says that he's near to us. But what does it say, Paul says? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Can you imagine reading this and being a Jew? Like, this has got to be like, either you're so hard that it's just making you harder, or you're just like weeping in freedom, right? And this weight is just falling off of you because you're like, it's about faith, it's about Christ, and he did it. That if you confess with your mouth, here's some more work for you. The only work I can find scripture. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and then you might be saved. <laughs> like, we're never going to really grasp this. The gospel's so simple, but yet it's like this mystery. But yet, a 12-year-old can read it and get saved, Right? He can totally come to Christ, even younger than that. I mean, just five years old, however, I don't know. But it's a simple gospel, but isn't it amazing how simple it's not? It's like so simple, but it requires just surrender. So what, is the, what does Romans 10, 9, and 10 re require? It says it requires a belief in two things. First, that Jesus is Lord. If he's not Lord, then it's not going to work out for you. Because that was the problem with the first guy, right? I want to be God, Lucifer. God's like, no, we're not bringing any of you to this new place. The new place that I'm making, no, we're, we're not going to bring those guys, those people with us. The people that are going with us to the new place, we're all on the same side. We all agree that I'm God, <laughs> right? We're not going to do this game again. And so the first thing is that you have to know that Jesus is Lord, the Lord of your life. And secondly, that you believe that God raised Christ from the dead. Because if you don't believe that God raised Christ from the dead, then there's no power. If Jesus' blood didn't wash away your sin, if that wasn't the, the sacrifice had to be made. Because God can't just wink at sin. He's just. He's perfect. He's holy. And if there was another way, he would have done it another way. But there wasn't. But God raised him from the dead, and the Bible says it's the same Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that lives in you that gives you life. Because you put on Christ, not a habit. True faith always leads to confession. Like Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, when he said, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, right? That's how you always know it's on the inside. <clears throat> it's true you just start saying things, you're like, whoa, that's not normal. Because it's really God's changing your heart, you know, that day you get saved. The first thing I said when I got saved, I looked at my friends and I said, dude, God's effing, I mean, God's amazing and we're dumb. Like, what are we doing? He loves us. And I look back and I go, that's weird, I changed my vocabulary. I wasn't doing that because I was trying to earn points with God, but I was new in that moment. There was a change that took place. I was regenerated, and there was a new creature in Christ, and my spirit was alive. And no longer was I just being led around by the body. You know, it looks good, feels good, tastes good. I had a spiritual relationship with the Father in like that second. Isn't that amazing? And he changes you. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. How do you get to righteousness? By working really hard? By believing unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So people bag on the whole come forward thing. I can't believe it. Christians are the worst. They're the ones that are like the worst for, like if you're a Christian and you're having a hard time, it's probably because of another Christian. 
<laughs> it's so true. But like, it's funny, if you're a pastor, oh my gosh, like, every, every generation, it's like all of a sudden we go, yeah, that was dumb, I don't know why we were doing that, and they blame the pastor, you know? Like, why is that guy always bringing everybody forward or whatever? That was so dumb, that's not biblical. And it's like, dude, all it is, and I say I have an altar call every Sunday, but I say be led by the Spirit, you know? But I'm just saying that you, if you can't stand and confess, what does the Bible say? You confess me before men, I confess you before my Father, but if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. Like, he hung on the cross for you, and you can't go like this, I want to accept Jesus Christ. Like, if, then what kind of a faith is that, right? There has to be some kind of a faith or, or it's not real, right? Like the faith part is going, I don't care what people think anymore, right? Because if you're in the closet, man, then tomorrow the enemy is going to go, that wasn't real. And you're going to go, was it? Because you never got out of the closet. You know, you never, you never walked in it. You just talked about it. But you got to jump off and get in it and go. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him, on him, putting your weight on him, believing on him, will not be put to shame. I love that. Because it says that Satan believes and he trembles. Right? The demons believe and they tremble. But that's not what it's saying. To believe on, if you truly believe with all of your heart that the creator of the universe died on the cross for your sins and his blood was enough to wash you clean, it's crazy because you, when you believe it, it changes you. Right there, boom, that's salvation, number one. But then after that, if you don't feed your spirit, I don't know, you can kind of drift in your mind and start thinking weird things, because that's what the enemy likes to do, if you don't feed yourself with the word of God. But this, according to the scripture, we're, you're saved forever. It's not like you have to go get re-saved, man. If I have an argument with my wife, there's a little discrepancy, because she, she's wrong, probably. No, <laughs> no probably me. But um, every time we have an argument, I don't have to go get remarried with her. But there's a split in our relationship. But the question is, well, were you ever married? Because God, it's all about the heart, right? In a sense, you could go get married and not be married with God. Because you're just signing the paper, but what does that mean? What was happening in here, you know? But you'll know when it's real, because you're going to go, that's not me, that was someone else. That was the Holy Spirit. Right? That was the spirit side of me, and I have to keep beating down the old, the old guy, because he'll just keep rising up, you know? For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. It's universal. For the, name, the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. That's so cool, man, because it's not about how intellectual you are. You know, like, no, what, Calvinists are constantly preaching to believers to become Calvinists. Why? I'm already saved, dude. Have you ever had that happen to you yet? Yeah. I have. I was in Bible college and I'm reading my Bible by myself in the coffee shop, man, and I'm around by myself. I'm like, man, it's like kind of alone. And then these dudes walk in and they're reading their Bibles and I'm like, that's awesome. So I'm like, cool. I want to go talk to them, you know, because they're probably brothers, brothers in Christ. And they came over and they were talking to me. And I was like going, this is amazing, this is amazing. And then it was like, I realized. They had these things memorized, and they were like, so tell us what you believe, you know, and it was like, all of a sudden I realized, well, they're trying to get me to say that basically God said, you go to heaven, you go to hell, you go to heaven, you go to hell, and I said, that's not what I read in scripture, <laughs> you know, but you can always find scriptures that show both, because God is God and we're not, and you're never going to completely understand him or else he's not going to be your God anymore, is he? I mean, honestly. He's way beyond what we are, and I think it's kind of foolish to think that we have to actually, every text, come to a logical conclusion. That's not going to happen, man. It's called faith, right? But what happens is that intellectual thing takes place. If it was like that, then people that were having a hard time with mental health wouldn't go to heaven, right? Because you weren't able to figure it out in the scriptures of what the truth was, you know? That's not how it is, no. What does it say? To all... Who call upon him. That's amazing. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I love because he says it more than once. Here he says, 
calls upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. And then in a minute we'll read another one. But Joel 2.32, because we go look in the Old Testament, where Paul is like, check this out. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's the same verse. He's pulling from that because he's showing them it's always been that way. Even in the Old Testament, that's why Abraham, he was righteous by faith. Not because of being circumcised, not, it was before the law. But he was righteous because it was imputed upon him because he believed. It was because of his faith. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So who, how then shall they call on him? So then the question comes, how can they call on him? How can they call on him in whom they have not believed? So if you, right there, that's pretty simple because like, if you're an atheist, how are you going to call on him, right? He doesn't exist. But then why are you mad about everything? Because if he doesn't exist, then why do you care if we have a cross? You know what I mean? Like, if it doesn't mean anything, then why does it matter? Because you do believe. <laughs> you know, you just don't want to have a relationship with him. But how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And so here's more responsibility. Beyond, yes, I have to say, yes, Lord. I have to believe in my heart. And if I want to get closer to God, I fix my eyes upon him. That's the only thing I strain for. Let Paul forget everything else, pressing forward towards the goal for the knowledge of Jesus Christ, to get to know him. That's my striving, is to be closer to Jesus in my relationship. That's how I do it, by faith. But the responsibility also comes here that afterwards we're to take the good news to the world. Mm -hmm. That's the other responsibility because Paul exhorting, is exhorting us here and he does it with these four rhetorical questions. He says, how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So he's just asking these questions, but it's rhetorical. But if they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, or but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So Paul is showing, that's from uh, Deuteronomy 32, and this is from Isaiah 65.1 showing that God planned all along to include the Gentiles in this ultimate plan of salvation. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Israel hasn't all obeyed. For, so then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is so cool, because, okay, you, you just learned that to get close to Jesus is by faith, right? Well, how do you increase your faith? The Word of God, right? That, that's it, right? Like the Word of God. I remember this, this was a very uh, drastic moment in my walk, too. I was a brand new believer, walking around and they, like a chicken with my head cut off, and, you know, legalistic probably, <laughs> telling everybody about Jesus and just freaking out on him, and they're like, whoa, bro. <laughs> and I was like, I'm teaching youth group. And uh, besides that was insane that the pastor let me do that. But, because <laughs> that was like, whoa, fresh out of the world. But, <clears throat> um, oh, what was I going to say right there? Uh, oh, faith comes by hearing the word of God. So, for, for you, I looked up this thing because I was trying to learn how to study. And I saw it in a little book. So you get the yarn and you tie it, sit in a circle, and you tie it around your finger and say one thing you know about Christ. Throw it to somebody. They catch it and they tie it around their finger and they say something they know about Christ and throw it to someone else. And every time you tie it off, you say something that you know is true about Jesus. And then you throw it, right? And then what happens is like we get like almost kind of web going, but it's not very strong, you know? And I'd like take my Bible and go, they just like fall right through it, you know? Mm -hmm. But the more you knew about Christ, mm -hmm. the stronger foundation you had, right? Mm -hmm. The more weight you could put upon it, you know? And that is so true. How simple is that? Mm -hmm. That all I have to do is stay in my word. If I stay in my word, then I get an increase in faith. So wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. I thought I was supposed to strain like at that to me. I gotta have, so I don't get sick and stuff. Right? Like, mm. 
Like, how about just say, you need to stay in your word. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? The, 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 the people that are usually down that path of like, it's by how hard you, it's like almost like this, how hard you believe. It doesn't work like that. Who gives you your faith? God. He gives a measure of faith to all of us, right? But we just read how it grows. It doesn't, I can't will faith. It's not about my strength, right? I kind of relate it to somebody that has anxiety, real anxiety or some kind of mental illness. Somebody that's never had mental illness, they go, oh, you're just weak, man. You just gotta think it through and be like, oh, mine never matter. Obviously, you've never had real mental health. Because I was one of those. And I made fun of my mother-in-law all the time. I'd be like, I prayed for you, man. What's the matter with you? You have agoraphobia. Why don't you just get in the car and drive? We just prayed, you know? I didn't understand it. Then I went to Afghanistan, came back, and I was all messed up. I'm starting to have anxiety and Sweating and feeling like I'm in Afghanistan, but I'm not. I'm in the ER, you know, doing working. And I'm like, it feels like I'm there, though. And I'm like, whoa, everything in me was just. And it's like, could I have, was that me because I was weak or I wasn't, you know, well, some people can handle it, you know. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. You're absolutely ridiculous. That's like you break your arm, you know, and it's like, well, suck it up, dude, you know. <laughs> It'll heal in a couple months, you know. <laughs> it's like, if you would have just been, think, if you just focus on it, man, it'll go away, the pain will go away, you know. It's like, you don't understand, no, it's called an injury, dude, just because you can't see it. It's why you're wearing a mask, too, because you think that thing's doing something. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, no, it's not. <laughs> but I say, in verse 18, I have, I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. He's talking about creation. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are, are not a nation. Moses said that. Who's he talking about? The Jews are getting provoked because we're Gentiles, and what in the world do we deserve to go to heaven for? You know, why do we, who are we, you know? But they don't realize that we're all at the same place. That they're not good and we're not good. <laughs> Nobody is good. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. That doesn't say a lot about us, does it? But it's true. A foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands. This is God. This is so cool. All day long I have stretched out my hands for you to, be a, to a disobedient and contrary people. And so when we read that, someone that's legalist will go, see, you got to be obedient. Yes, but it's not how you get there. It's not how you get there, right? The way you get there is not by striving. It was because what? They had the word of knowledge in their mind. What did Jesus say to them, though? You know all these scriptures, but you don't know me. <laughs> like, how's your relationship? I always think about my relationship with my wife. Why is it hard for a husband to come home and sit down and actually just listen? <laughs> Why does that work? I don't know. But sometimes it can be because we're just wired different, you know? Because we're just like, go, 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 and you know, fix it, you know? But she's like, will you just sit and listen to me and don't try to fix it? I'm like, I don't, why is that so hard for me? And it's like, you know, it's like this relationship, you know, that's, it doesn't happen by me. I can run around and do all this stuff. I ain't gonna do anything, you know. It's, it's it's so cool how God shows us all that stuff as we have kids. It's about your relationship with your kids. You see it every day. If you're a parent, you know what it is. It's not like uh, you know. You, you, if your son like goes out and he does all this stuff for you, you're like yes. What if he just comes up and he gives you a hug and he hangs out with you for the day? You know, and that's what Jesus is saying. He's like, man, I just want to be with you, bro. You know? 
I just want to spend time with you. I died for you to realize that no longer can anything separate you from me. So why are you over there? Just because the enemy's telling you you're a loser, why are you believing? Don't you have the faith to know that I died for that? And now you can hang out with me, right? Like we, we can be together, you know, all the time. I always felt, my one pastor would tell me, I'd tell him, he always had these words of wisdom or whatever. <laughs> like you'd say, you're not the sharpest pencil in the box, are you? <laughs> no, <laughs> that wasn't a good one. But, um, <laughs> no, he said, uh, I remember I would say, like, man, it was difficult because I was just saved. And I felt like I had no friends and I was alone. And, uh, and you just feel that. But then the world would come by, right? And they go, I'm in trouble. And where do they go? They go to the believer, right? Your worst enemy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> not, you, not that you're their enemy, but they should act like yours, you know? <laughs> and you're like, what in the world? Why is this person talking to me now? It's because they don't want to talk to you. They want to talk to God. And they know that you know them. Well, it's crazy because you're the pit stop in the pit stop. <laughs> and they're going around the track. And then every now and then they go, I got a flat tire. Crap, they pull in, right? <laughs> And then you're like, hey, what's up, bro? I'm over here hanging out with Jesus, you know? Let me show you. He could do this for you, man. Yeah, see how cool that is? And they go, cool, man. See you later. You know? And then I'm like, going, oh, next time he comes in, I'm like, you know, oil runs out. You know, I need oil to change, man. And I'm like, dude, you know you're going to ever have to go back out there, right? <laughs> you can just stay here with me, bro, and him, you know? Like, he's got you, you know? And it's like, you know, I'm going to go out here and do this more, you know? Like, run circles, you know? And... It's so true because, uh, and that's what religion is, man. You know, you're like, well, I came in and I got my tire rotated. You know, I well, look at how shiny my car is. You know, like I'm keeping it. You're like, no, man, it's not about that. It's not about you being a sinner or not a sinner. We've already accomplished that. You're a sinner. <laughs> you won the prize. You know, you're a sinner. Like, you qualify. You know, like that's done. Move to the next topic. Okay, what's the next topic? I want to be with you, God. Okay, what's keeping you from Him? I go, I didn't do this, man. I'm a sinner. I can't do. Okay, well, are you going to stay behind the leaves like Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. or are you just going to take the leaves off and go, God, you already see me anyway. What am I going to hide from, right? I can't hide from you. Might as well just take the leaves off and be real and say, God, I don't even want. I don't want to read your Bible. Would you please help me? Would you give me the desire to read your word? Because I need it. God, I don't want to quit smoking pot. Lord, would you please help me? I don't know, make me vomit every time I smoke a bowl, you know, or something. You know, I don't know. Make me sick, you know, or whatever. But then he's faithful, man. Like, if you're just real with him, that's all he wants is a relationship. Like, we're not lying. Isn't that the worst when your kid's lying and you know it? And they think they're so smart, and you're like, dude, you're straight up lying, bro. It's like, man, why are you lying? You don't need to lie to me, you know? And that's how it is. It's, God's like, I just want to be with you, man. You know? It's important that the word of God be, this is the last few things I wanted to say. To take away. Number one, salvation is not difficult. Whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, verse 11. Number two, it's important that the word of God be presented to lost sinners. It's the word that convicts, that gives faith, and that leads to Christ. The word of God. And that's important for a believer, man. We need to be sharing the word of God. And the third thing, there's only two religions in the whole world. It's either works or it's righteousness. It's a works righteousness or a faith righteousness. Which one? There's no in between. That's the only two religions in the world. Did you know that? Isn't that crazy? Think about it. Because if you're anything but Jesus Christ and Him crucified by grace through faith alone, then it's works, right? That fits in with Mormonism. That fits in with Jehovah's Witness. That fits in. I don't care if you're Baptist and you're still working. You know what I mean? If you think you got to be baptized, and I don't care what you're going to Calvary Chapel or anything like. And you're still in a works religion. Mm -hmm. But nobody can fulfill the, the first, but everybody can respond mm -hmm. 
to the second? You can't fulfill the first, but can you respond to the second and just say, yes, Lord, I believe, you know? Dear Lord, I love you, Father. I just thank you for your word. You're so good. Your word is amazing. Because, God, there's so many things that aren't true around us every day. We could waste our breath all day long trying to tell someone the truth. and Hopefully we don't do that, God. It's just a waste of time and not very edifying. But, Lord, it's so refreshing when we read your word and we read something that we, we knew, we believed, but then when we read it, God, and it's like, that is true. That's still true. It's still true. It's still true that your blood is eternal and that nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's still true that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Man, Lord, it's crazy because with those two things, we should be, we should just be living it up. <laughs> never have any fears, never have any worries, but God, we know that that's not till the future. But I pray till then, Lord Jesus, I pray that while we're in this earth, that we could use this opportunity to glorify you, God. First, to glorify you in our own lives by not walking in the flesh, but by walking in the Spirit, Lord. By just choosing to walk in the Spirit. Not choosing to not walk in the flesh, but just choosing to walk in the Spirit so that we don't walk in the flesh. That we would have a constant awareness of your presence in our lives. We just want to have that joy, God. The same joy that you had when you went to the cross for us, Lord, the, the joy that was set before you. God, we want that joy, the joy of the Lord, knowing that you went to the cross for us. And that, man, all these things are fading away, and truly we could say, like, Paul, oh, it's all garbage anyways. We just keep fixing our eyes upon you. We love you, God. I just pray that we would grow closer to you and to know you more. And I do pray if there's anything in our lives that you would remove it, I pray. I pray that if there's anything that we're struggling at, that you would just show us. I pray that if we're hiding behind the leaves, God, that you would show us that we are where you don't even know we are. And Lord, that's the best feeling in the world when there's something new, something new that we can give to you. And I pray that there's something new we can give it to you today. Something in our lives that you've been saying let go of. That we would see that as an opportunity, God, to bless you and to be free. That you would take it out of our life, Lord. And that we would fill that emptiness that's left with more of you. Love you, Father, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen.